you know, before prohibition, the America peaked with like 4,000 breweries because there was no transportation and there was no refrigeration and then prohibition hit and it took, you know, until like, I don't know, the early eighties to get back to 4,000 breweries. And now there's close to 10,000 breweries. So the, 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 the fresh local, you know, trend that's happened in so many different industries has definitely applied to beer as well. And, you know, I think it back in the day, I used to think you wanted to be Indiana Jones sliding under the wall. Like, could you be the last brewery that made it going nationally? You know, like, like, a, like a, a, like a Lagunitas or, you know, if you remember Ballast Point, uh, Sculpin and all that. So, so who was the fat tire? Who was the last brewery that slid under the wall and, and made it nationally? Now I'm thinking, and I've over the course of the last several years changed my thought to being like being stuck on the other side of the wall was the best thing that happened to a lot of people. Welcome back to Winning at Work. It's season three, the podcast for the food and beverage and CPG world. I'm Jennifer Lee, Tony's new marketing sidekick and creative guru. I'll attempt to keep him on track as we discover the ideas and strategies behind all these different, better, and special brands. Oh, good luck keeping me on track, but I am really stoked to have you on the team, Jennifer. Your background in marketing and SEO and socials, we are going to have so much fun this year. We're going to be discovering the new brands here in 2023. It's all about functional, good for you, lifestyle brands. Those are trending. Those are the products that are gaining market share and really pulling away from those old legacy brands. We're going to have each and every one of those brands down on the podcast to talk to us, to share their ideas, their inspiration. So you, the entrepreneur, so you, the food and beverage and CPG professional can take these new ideas in and incorporate them into your business and into your life. Oh my gosh, Tony, I'm seriously so excited i feel like i learn so much just from listening to older episodes well that's why we're here and if this is your first time here i would recommend look go back take the five episode challenge pick a brand pick a ceo an entrepreneur dive in listen to what it is that they're teaching us if you love the content subscribe we hope you're along with us for the journey each and every week by the way Do you have a favorite brand in your market you would love for us to amplify on this national platform? Reach out to us on LinkedIn. And stay tuned for this week's episode. Hey, it's Jennifer. We get it. Everyone hates hiring. Inspired by his guest, Tony created a novel talent acquisition program that attracts the hidden candidate market, the 70% of people that are not actively applying to jobs. Click on the attract link in the show notes to watch a demo. Welcome to Winning at Work. It is Tony and I've got my buddy Matt Kovacs here. What's going on out in California these days, my man? You know, it's uh, weather getting better, seasonal affective disorder is over, but it's still, uh, you know, cold in the mornings. It hits about 50. So we have our sweaters on. What did you say? Seasonal what? Seasonal affective disorder. Yeah, sad. I get, you know, you get sad when it goes below uh, 60 and it's not. Why have I not? I, I probably should have heard that expression before. I um, I try not, not to let the weather affect me, though, too much. It's part of our uh, DNA here. We pay the weather tax. So, yes, now we're happy <laughs> it's starting to be sunny again. That's right. You're you're coming out of the tunnel. Well, by the time this is published, I think it's, we're going to be probably mid-February. So I know for a lot of us, we kind of feel like we're starting to slide into spring. And as that happens, people go out more. They want to sit outside and go to a brewery and sit down and have a beer somewhere, right? And Bill Wetmore of Fathead is here to talk to us about everything in his whole life and history within the brew uh, industry. Now, let's all sit back. We're not going to talk about everything. (laughs) I want you to be put on your uh, Theodore Roosevelt hat. I need I need to hear those big quotes. <laughs> big quotes, right. big quotes, and, bi- and big, big impressive stories. Well, welcome down, Bill. Glad to have you on uh, Winning at Work. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I thought it was interesting. Again, knowing uh, you know your your uh, career, if you will, but I think now when you look at the craft industry, you look at sort of where you guys are positioned. I thought it was again an interesting perspective to have you uh, come and enlighten people about what's going on, especially, you know, within your 
uh, for Wells there? Yeah, if you think about going back, I started working, you know, in the beer industry in 97, working on Newcastle Brown Ale, you know, back in the day when craft beer was very, very limited, what was available, styles that were available, where it was available, and progressed through like working for a Belgian style brewery. Uh, so in Belgian beers, now to a regional craft brewery. I feel like I'm going from 30,000 feet down to 10,000 feet, down to 5,000 feet. You know, uh, probably five years from now, I'll just be making my own beer and selling it. <laughs> You'll to be family, a home brewer. Selling it to family. So. <laughs> well, before you get all the way down to home brewer, you need to make a pit stop in Robbinsville, North Carolina, the middle of nowhere. Beautiful outside country, but we need a brewery here in a bad way. So you could... Just before you get into home brewing, this will be like your next to last stop. We, we could definitely use that that good vibe here. Home brewing is a, is definitely a last resort. Um, but ending up in the Carolinas drinking good craft beer, I'm I'm down for that. I would tell you this is this is an amazing place for sure. We're about an hour and a half uh, west of Asheville. Um, so tell us a little bit just about uh, Fathead and the Fatheads and the. Um, the brewery, the brand, what are you guys trying to, you know, kind of portray to your uh, consumers? So, yeah, so Fathead's Brewery, we, we actually originally started as a restaurant in Pittsburgh. Uh, Matt probably knows as much about that as I do with his Pittsburgh roots. Uh, but September 11th, 1992, 30 years ago, 30 years ago in a little bit, they opened up the restaurant on the south side of Pittsburgh. And very craft progressive. Uh, as we said, there wasn't a ton of options, you know, the Sam Adams and the rogues and, uh, Sierra Nevadas. There wasn't, you know, as many, nearly as many as there are today, but whatever they could find, they were bringing in. So they wanted to, you know, diversify the craft or the beer community in Pittsburgh. And, uh, it wasn't all about iron city and they brought in as much craft beer as they could. So the, the DNA of Fatheads has always been to be, you know, very uh, craft forward and focused on uh, as much stylistic uh, differentiation as they could. And lived as a restaurant just, uh, you know, 1992 to 2008, solely existed as a restaurant on the south side of Pittsburgh. And then we had a um, what we call our, our Ohio founder, our master brewer who had gone to Pitt, decided he wanted to open up his own brew pub after apprenticing at places like Great Lakes and Rocky River Brewing Company and a few other breweries, decided he was going to open up his own brewery. And it was 2008. You know, that financial crisis was just hitting the last financial crisis before the one that we most recently went through uh, and was looking for another investor and remembered this great craft uh, bar that he used to spend time at when he was at Pitt, got to know Glenn, the Pittsburgh owner, and said, hey, why don't you guys get involved in this? You guys love craft beer. I'm doing something I think could be fun and interesting. Glenn jumped on board and said, you know what? We've already got kind of this equity built up in the Fatheads brand. Let's, let's, let's just bring that imagery. Let's bring that brand association to Ohio. And that's how the operation that opened up in Ohio became a Fatheads and that existed solely as a brew pub until 2016. Sorry, I apologize. Till 2012, and then the demand for the beer was so strong that uh, they joined up and put a production brewery in place. And that's how we ended up making beer. So we make beer in Ohio. We call our root, rooted in PA, and we grew up in Ohio. That's the backstory there. How far is the brand um, carried now? Is it uh, New York, Michigan? I guess how how much of a regional player do you guys uh, touch? Well, I never touch Michigan. I'm from Ohio. <laughs> you know, let's, let's say I avoid Michigan. Um, but uh, no, we're we're in Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, upstate New York, state of Indiana, and Kentucky. So I, I guess now is not a good time to say I went to the University of Georgia. Is it University of Georgia? Does that end this podcast? Uh, I have more issues with, uh, game management than the Bulldogs themselves. <laughs> I think we yeah, for up. those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the, uh, college football playoff yeah. where, uh, Ohio state pretty much owned Georgia for the first three quarters 
and then somehow uh, lost by one point. Yeah, we, we gave that one away. But, you know, the, the, the thing that's, that's really special and unique about Fatheads, about us, is we ever since we've existed as a brewery, we've been uh, winning, the, you know, kind of the Academy Awards and the Grammys of beer are Great American Beer Festival medals and World Beer Cup medals. And since we've been in existence, you know, since 2012, uh, two, well, even going back to the brew pubs, our first medal was 2009. We've won 38 of those. Uh, so definitely the most uh, awarded Ohio brewery, regional brewery, one of the probably, I would guess, probably top five or eight breweries in the country. And what we take a lot of pride in is we're known for our IPAs, we're known for our fruit beer, but we've won across German Schwartz beers, Hefeweizens, uh, smoke beers, uh, black uh, IPAs, red IPAs, uh, traditional IPAs. So uh, a lot of expertise and thoughtfulness brought into our beers. And, and uh, so a little bit of a national reputation for a regional brewery, which is really special. Well, and with that, is there the urge there to try and go national or do you go you know, more regional, bigger, broader? What's the, the play there? And obviously with your background. Yeah, I think like, you know, kind of working the way my career has gone from the, you know, national, international brewery, really international breweries, and then starting to work downwards. Uh, the, the evolution of the beer business, it, it, I think the, the future is strong regional, strong local brands. That's just the way it's gone for the last 10, 15 years. You know, there's some crazy stat you know, before Prohibition, the America peaked with like 4,000 breweries because there was no transportation and there was no refrigeration. And then Prohibition hit and it took, you know, until like, I don't know, the early 80s to get back to 4,000 breweries. And now there's close to 10,000 breweries. So the, 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 the fresh local, you know, trend that's happened in so many different industries has definitely applied to beer as well. And, you know, I think it, back in the day, I used to think you wanted to be Indiana Jones sliding under the wall. Like, could you be the last brewery that made it going nationally? You know, like, <laughs> like, a, like, a, a, like a Lagunitas or, you know, if you remember Ballast Point, uh, Sculpin and all that. So, so who was the fat tire? Who was the last brewery that slid under the wall and, and made it nationally? Now I'm thinking, and I've, over the course of the last several years, changed my thought to being like, being stuck on the other side of the wall was the best thing that happened to a lot of people. Um, because if you look at what's happened in the last five, seven years as well, how many breweries have, have either gone completely out of business or they were in 38 states, then they went back to 22 states, then they went back to 15 states, and they kept retrenching. And what you find is the reason they're doing that is because, you know, that the needs are being serviced by somebody – as well or better closer to home and there's more loyalty there. And then the cost to operate further from home, the cost to ship your beer across the country to maintain salespeople across the country to have A and P budgets that support, you know, far flung places, you know, the, the business model just doesn't work uh, the way it, it, it did in the past. I'm just curious though, if you did want to open a brewery in another town, you know, what, what are you talking about? How, how much of a investment are you, is a company looking at roughly? Well, I think that's also a different, uh, provocation as well. So what, what, what the other model that seems to be succeeding or, 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 or at least being repeated and, and seems to be doing well is, okay, I'm going to go plant a flag somewhere else. I'm going to open up a, an on-premise location. I have a friend of mine that is working for a brewery in Virginia and uh, just they, they just opened a, a location in Pittsburgh. And so I think that if you have a, where you're having these, you know, they call it own premise instead of on-premise. So you, you know, if you're setting up your satellite tap rooms and your satellite, you know, restaurants and brew pubs, in another market, then I think you're starting to establish, you know, secondary home bases. And I think those potentially create a, a, a model that you can win on because now you're, you're building and creating locality and loyalty. So 
Yeah, but to to answer your question, you know, I mean, it's all it all depends on the aspiration uh, as far as you know. You could probably get away with opening something small in the right market for you know less than a million dollars, or you can spend seven million dollars and do something that's it, it, it's all. It, it, I think a lot of it comes down to what do you want the on-site experience to be? You know, here when we build our new facility in 2018. We have a 250 seat restaurant. You know, we've we, we've got capacity up to 150 thousand barrels that we could grow to on site. You know, we have the space to grow that capacity uh, to that level. So, you know, we're different than somebody who's, you know, you can take over an existing space, get a 10 barrel system, and probably do that. You know, you know, and and, and survive and thrive with the right business model and the right market. Uh, so I think it, you know, like anything, it, it's the scale of the restaurant. Do you want to be a hot dog stand or do you want to be a Morton Steakhouse? You know. Yeah, it, that's and that's what the the customer wants. They really do want that experiential. I mean, that's I, that kind of ties back into the whole local vibe and getting to see the people that work there and see how you craft it, and then you know, they, they experience it. And then when they do find it in say a grocer or a retailer, it's like, Oh, I had a great experience, you know, with these guys, you know, I, I want to get that in a can as well. Absolutely. Let, let me ask you this question. So you're, you're in North Carolina near Asheville, obviously Asheville is the East coast epicenter of craft brewing. Um, right. But when, so do you have in the community you're in, how many local kind of uh, brew pubs or small little you know, brewery zero, zero. Okay. You know, we're, we're so far West. So I could say we're, we're an hour and a half from Asheville. So that, that's why I was kind of sure. joking with you, you know, before you became a home brewer, please come to Robbinsville. Well, it's just, you know, it's funny because, you know, it used to be local was your state. Then local was a, your city. Then local was your suburb. Now local is your street. Like, you know, the number of craft, bre- craft breweries that I could swing a stick at and hit, you know, and I'm in, you know, obviously a bigger community in Cleveland. Um, but no, I was going to ask because, uh, you know, Matt, you probably, you're going out to some local breweries and brew pubs in California and it, it, there's, there's going to be more of those. What do you find um, qualitatively? Do you find that you're seeing consistency at those places? Do you find that they're... Um, you're delivering a good beer experience to you? Well, I think it's the microcosm of what you talked about because Beachwood Brewery is a big one here in uh, Long Beach. And they went from two to three and then they cut back to two and now they're going to go back to one. So mm-hmm. you're seeing that the quality is great. And everyone go, you know, the, the one in Seal Beach is the one that's the um, the hero one that everyone, you know, where it started. But you're, you're able to have that experience. You go to where it's going to be the best. The other ones have started to, um, again, why they're closing. There's just not the traffic. There's not the experience. And you don't have the same feeling. And I think that's you hit it there where if you get too big, then it feels like a copy of a copy. Well, I th- yeah. And I think the hardest thing in, in brewing is consistency. And, you know, there's one thing you, you, you drink a Budweiser on any place in America. And if it's the same plus or minus the same birthday, it's going to taste the same. Um, and that, that's consistency that you strive for. Uh, I find that, you know, I go and I try some of these and it seems like lo- locality trumps quality. Sometimes it's like they will support the local, even if it's maybe not, maybe they're not delivering the best experience. Maybe it's not most, the most consistent or it's maybe it's got some, you know, off flavors, this, that, or the other. And that's an interesting thing psychologically to see, you know, would, would you go to the burger joint that maybe you didn't enjoy your burger as much last time or would you say, you know what, that burger wasn't that great last time. I'm going to go to another one. But there are definitely some people that are like, well, I'm going back there because it's local. There's something about beer that people, I don't know, they overcome that when you see it in some other commodities and some other industries. It, it, I just find that psychologically pretty interesting. Well, I think it also depends on just how many are in your area. Yeah. Uh, I'm in an area that is so small that <clears throat> the natural beauty is, is off the charts here. But the big industry left. And so it's kind of a depressed area now. And because we have so few things, if there's anything that's good, you just support it. You just like, 
Yep. Stick around, stay, get better. And you were touching on, you know, Matt, you, they went from three to two to one. I think one of the problems that companies have when they try to scale is they can't control their culture. They lose their culture. They don't have the same people, the same vibe. But right that that first brew pub or that um, that place where some of the owners kind of hang out too, It how do you replicate that? And I would imagine that is definitely a obstacle, you know, when you look at growing. That was a, when we moved from our, original production facility, which we were in from 2012 to 2016. We just had a small little tap room. I was just showing people pictures of it yesterday. It's probably, you know, probably 20, 18, 20 seats at the bar. And maybe you got 60 to 80 people, you know, at tables around there. And when we came to the new place, obviously, we're like, this is great. We can engage with so many more people. We can entertain so many more people. But a lot of the regulars miss that kind of intimacy and the, you know, the owner going behind the bar and pouring a pint for you, uh, which wasn't happening at the new place like it did at the old place. So that's that's absolutely a, a, a challenge that you have to find a way to overcome is is growing your culture, you know, and in, in letting it flourish, but not losing that the core DNA of it. Not to water it down. Pun intended. I mean, you just. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, the other thing that these, these brew pubs really struggled with COVID was a real challenge for the, the people that were not putting their beer into bottles and cans. Because all of a sudden, how were you drinking that beer? You couldn't go to your local brew pub for a while. Yeah. On prem um, really suffered. On premise really got beat up. And you saw some people rush into partnering with mobile canning people getting growler systems, getting crowler systems. And so, the, you know, in some ways, COVID was a, was a really, really good thing for us in moving into a new uh, facility like we did, you know, and, and having a very successful restaurant, you know, right out of the gate honeymoon period. You know, you, COVID helped us find efficiency. COVID, you know, because COGS went up, COGS have been going up on everything and, so that created a real challenge for us is, you know, when, when push came to shove and everything got really, really tight and really more challenging and on-premise was sluggish, it's like, how do we do this more efficiently? And it really made us a better operation because we started at the top and went all the way to the bottom. And just, you know, it's amazing what you can do when you, when, when you have to, when you find out, hey, can we do this at you know, this level of manpower or this level of, you know, spend? Um, and I think we came out better for it. And I think that the beer's better for it as well. You talked a little bit about the awards in, in that aspect. And again, I know you're known for the breadth, but talk to me about innovations. Like, how do you keep up with all the uh, a- activities that go on in this category? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, certainly there's constant evolution. And it's not even just beer, right? You know, we think about, uh, the seltzer phenomenon of like the last three or five years, um, canned cocktails have become more uh, prevalent and, you know, crap, you know, obviously every, the, the major players are doing all that stuff as well, but a lot of, you know, boutique craft breweries or boutique distilleries are doing those types of things as well. So the, the, the competition is coming, you know, not just within the beer category, but coming from all different sides. Um, you know, we we, we have a new beer launching, uh, in about two more weeks, it was a seasonal beer for us last year, uh, but it's a it's a tangerine IPA, and it's called Juice to Jupiter, and we're really excited about that. It did really well as a seasonal for us, but you know what I, I guess there's a couple ways that we come about innovation, right? So the brewers are mad scientists. They 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 mess around with things and say, hey, I came up with something cool and interesting. I'd like to try, and that all almost always leads to something good. But then I, you know, there's also looking for opportunity in the market, right? Seeing where there's, you know, a gap in the market or seeing where there is an inefficiency or, or yeah, the white less, space, less competition. So, you know, so when we looked at, you know, IPAs are probably close to 60% of all the beer that gets, that gets drunk in the U S is an IPA and one craft beer, one way, shape or form is an IPA. And we're known for our IPAs. We have a, we probably have, we have four or five everyday IPAs. Then we make all these seasonal IPAs. So coming out with a new IPA and innovation was like, wait, what are you doing? But 
when we looked at fruited IPAs, there's one that does really well in the state of Ohio, and then there's a just a, a complete fall off the cliff. And so it's differentiated versus our other IPAs. Um, it's got room and runway to grow in a, in a segment that's growing. People are, are between hazies and fruit forward IPAs are drinking less bitter stuff. They're, they're trying to, they want the IPA, but they want a little bit less bitter. So we looked at it that way and we see opportunity categorically and say, well, maybe there's a gap we can fill there. And because IPAs in one way, shape or form are probably 60% of the business hitting a double uh, when you're making an IPA is, is better than maybe hitting a home run in a, in a Hefeweizen or a wheat beer or, you know, another category. Yeah. The volume is so much bigger. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The size of the prize is so much bigger. So, and a lot of, you know, test drinking, Matt, you know, which I know you always are willing to volunteer for is whenever we're experimenting, you know, we have our, yeah. Which by the way, Matt, do, who do I blame for having no samples sent to me? You got to go to podcast? Pittsburgh, though. No, it's all you have to go direct to the source. Oh, don't tell me the old three tier system. I don't want to hear we, that we, nonsense. We could have sent some quote unquote. I know. Yeast, I mean, Matt, yeast samples. We set, call it yeast samples when we send it, and then it's a uh, you know it gets where it needs to go. Matt, we're gonna have to really work on your etiquette. You're gonna hold the, hold Bill hostage until this airs, aren't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're in a uh, a beer vacuum. Actually, that's not true. We are now. Uh, we're, we're we were a dry county. We're now wet. So it's it's now in the grocery stores. That's how bad it's been over here. Um, so you touched on some of the innovations that are happening that come out of the brewers. Are there um, any new innovations brewing and brewing? Innovations brewing and brewing overall. Um, I wrote that down. It was so bad. There's well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, the big phenomenon like 10, 12 years ago was the hazy, right? That The New England hazy, that was, that, that was an evolutionary kind of craze. There's been experiments with like the, what did Sam Adams do with the Sam 76? It was like the uh, India, India Pale Lager, that's what it was. I think everybody's always tinkering and... and but it's not, I mean, you go to a country like Belgium and there's 350 styles of beer. It's hard to reinvent stuff, right? So I think there's just, there's a lot of reimagining on things, a lot of, a lot yeah. of twists. Um, and, you know, for a while it was, uh, you know, additives and stouts and pastry stouts and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think, 90% of the, of that craft community. And I think COVID did this as well. It brought people back to comfort styles and tried and true and things that they could rely on things that they knew were going to be good. When, when COVID hit grocery stores surged in like 12 pack and 15 pack and 24 pack sales. Um, people were hunkering down and, and buying in larger formats. And that's a trend that's continued. And I think part of that, you know, when you're in moments of uncertainty is, you know, what can I rely on? What can I trust? And so, it, you know, I, I do think that's a part of what happens. But, yeah, um, there's always going to be another new thing. In our, I, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of what we've seen in the last couple of years, though, is, is almost going outside of the, of the beer industry a little bit with those kind of pre-mixed canned cocktails and, and the right. seltzers and, you know, things of that nature. Well, and people are infusing products together. We see, you know, alcohol infused with coffee and this kind of stuff. Are you, do your brewers go into those kind of combinations of different categories or have you pretty much resisted that to this point? You know, there was a, you know, there was moments of discussing CBD infused. Uh, I was wondering about that one too, right? Yeah. Um, so, it could be a regional play if it's, you know, if it's allowed. I mean, obviously you've got regulations around that. So it, yeah. And it's changing. The national, state by state yeah. stuff is changing so quickly mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we definitely will. Um, we have some beers that uh, where we, where, where we're bringing fruit, fruit product into, for example, um, you know, like obviously the tangerine IPA, but also just, just some other stuff. Um 
we, we do some twists on our existing products. We have a, you know, our biggest beer is uh, bumbleberry. It's a honey blueberry ale and very like kind of summertime refreshing, but our guys have gone back and like added vanilla and cinnamon and all of a sudden created a, you know, same base beer, but a twist on it. So I think that, uh, that sounds good. Yeah. Actually. It's a, uh, it's, it's something that uh, we call it crumbleberry and people have, have taken to that. But I do think, you know, the line extensions um, where you're kind of taking your base beer and doing a little bit of a spin on it. You know, one of the most fastest growing uh, breweries this year has been uh, New Belgium. And they've just done so much with that, you know, kind of Voodoo Ranger series and uh, taking it in a lot of different directions. You know, we're, 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 we're careful about that because um, you, you, if you're going to do that, you, you want to make sure that you're not diluting your your flagship or you're diluting your main anchor brand. And so uh, we'll probably, when I think we have two brands strong enough to look at headhunter and bumbleberry where we could do some twists and spins and use the equity of those brands and broaden overall and one plus one equal three. So I think, but I think you got to be careful and make sure you have like that solid base before you go, go too far. Maybe we should do like a special logoing, you know, licensing deal with that headhunter. I mean, that would go perfect. I mean, that's my day job. Oh, is in that the your day and, job? Yeah, in the, in, in the food and beverage space. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, we that's we should do that. Well, we'll talk about within small batch. The the other thing within your brand, obviously, is the brand and the logo and everything itself. How does that help carry the brand through? Because you talked through again a lot of the other brands that have maybe the tried and true of, uh, aspects, but with, with fat heads, you guys have a lot more fun, I think. Yeah. The, the brand's always been really based in a, in a very playful nature. Right. And, you know, someone asked me yesterday where the, where the fat head face came from, where the guy came from. And, uh, our original Pittsburgh founder, Glenn, when he was starting up the, the restaurant, had a friend who drew that caricature on a cocktail napkin and Glenn gave him $50 on the spot, uh, which was very shrewd investment. And uh, that's how we ended up with that being the logo. And we've done, you know, if you know our, you know, product line at all, you know, we take that guy and then there's a twist and spin on that, you know, that guy in whatever new environment we put him in with whatever new beer, uh, you know, so on Goggle Fogger, he's an aviator and things like that and so on and so forth. But yeah, we, you know, when you go into a bar, you know, the first thing a lot of, you know, serious beer drinkers do is look at what the tap, what's on tap, right? They're looking over there to see what's on tap. And so having a, you know, a distinctive, playful, you know, the one thing you walk in, if you see, if we have fat heads on tap, you know it when you walk in because the tap handle is very distinctive. You may not know which of the beers is on tap yet. Um, you can, you know, get closer, find that out or see a beer list. But the great thing is, a lot of times just walking in to sell beer, holding the tap hand on your hand, the retailer's like, oh, I want to put that on draft. I got to find something that because oh, that's cool. they fall in kind love of with, iconic. Yeah. yeah, they fall in love with the icon um, and then they find a beer that, uh, that works for their bar, you know, in, out of our lineup. But yeah, I mean, beer's fun, right, Matt? I mean, you've been around it long enough. If you're not having fun doing it, you're in the wrong business. So... Well, before we get into the rapid fire, which I understand Matt has already pre-warned you, which is really. He didn't give me know, any hints of, as far as. Uh, that's good. That's good. I was just curious, well, that's well, that's yeah, you're going to have to be, kind of think on your feet. But I guess before we get into that, my last question would be, uh, what kind of a play do you guys make for merchandising? Is that part of your sales sell strategy at all? We have an online store. Um, we have uh, gift shops in each of our restaurants. So we've got. We still have the original brew pub, which is about 15 minutes west of us. We have a brew pub down by the Football Hall of Fame in Canton and obviously the original restaurant in Pittsburgh. So we've got four four brick and mortar locations and those gift shops were always coming out with new merch and you know playful things that uh, seem to go over really well for our fans. So yeah, that's an important part of what we do. Um, living in a market like Cleveland or Pittsburgh, it's great. I, I walk down the street and I, I see people wearing our stuff all the time, which is really cool. And um, that is super. Yeah, that that is cool. There, I mean, because Matt, we've had this conversation quite a bit, Bill, about 
uh, brand identification. People want to identify with something that's the lifestyle brand, right? And it makes sense that that they'd want to wear that kind of proudly. All right, I think you're uh, you're in the hot seat now, my friend. All Are right, you ready? You're sitting down, you're good. All right. Is there a clock that starts? Do I just there is? There is. Yes. It's just yeah. So it's a mental school. a mental clock. So right. the first thing is is always one I think is important. So tell us something that's true that nobody agrees with you on. And this doesn't have to be business related. This could be, you know, that the Indians should have won at least two World Series, you know, by now or something. You know, it could be anything. Everybody anyway. agrees with that, Matt. The Guardians. Guardians. That's uh, you something agree. that's true that, that people don't agree with me on. Yes. Um, don't say flat earth. Oh, my gosh. I'd have to edit you. You hit me with a tough one right out of the gate, Matt. Um, Usually that's the easy one. Something that you believe is true that no one else does or they think you're crazy. Uh, well, they don't think I'm crazy. I'll say, uh, I'll say this, uh, the, the, the Brown should have thought twice about bringing Deshaun Watson back. Is that, is that <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. I, I would agree with that one. I would agree. He was, uh, checkered, checkered to say the least. All right. Next one. What's well, the best? Here, you know, Matt, I want to build on that. What I'm going to say is the Browns are going to finish fourth in the division next year. How about that? Oh, all right. That's good. Yeah, that's my. That's my. Uh, nobody agrees with me on that. Uh, okay, there you the go. Best, we got to it. Okay, what is the best hundred dollars you recently spent? What was it, and why? The best hundred dollars I recently spent was on a new five wood, um, because the head went flying off of my old five wood, <laughs> and, I, and I and I and I duct taped it together three times because it was my favorite club in the bag. And uh, with the fourth time, oh my god! Off, fourth time it flew off. I said, I think it's time for a new five wood. So you're a five wood. See the seven, this the the oh five wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say because yeah. the uh, seven iron's my favorite. Okay, gotcha. All right, what's one trend that excites you? One trend that excites me. Um, oh dear God, I hope it's fruited IPAs because I'm spending a lot of. <laughs> The latest year. IPA you're, that's you're coming out. Forecasting, yeah, better work. If my if it if it doesn't turn out uh, that way, uh, I will might be moving to down to that brewing out of his house thing again. Uh, that might be my next step. What advice would you give your younger self? Oh my gosh, call Matt Kovacs earlier. Um, you know, younger self. Uh, I give my kids this advice all the time. Is is trust your gut and a little more use a little more common sense. Um, I think that uh, you know that's one thing where the world at our fingertips by Google and, and your phone um, is lose, we're losing a little bit of that. Uh, figure some stuff out on your own. Um, Amen. Come up with this. Come up with a solution that you don't have to go plug in. You know, punch, look for the answer through the Google machine. Um, so I guess roundabout way, I would say, you know, just. Figure, Use your head. You, you, you be, figure out how to survive and thrive uh, without an electronic device. All right, last one. What is your favorite quote? My favorite quote. Um, oh my gosh, my favorite quote is. Uh, hmm. I my favorite quote is. There's only one thing left to do. I could. We swear. Are we allowed to swear on the podcast? Go for it. There's only one thing left to do when the whole fucking thing. I mean, uh, and I've got, I'm counting on the, eventually that actually coming to fruition and the, the Guardians winning a World Series. That's my, uh, so. I think I'm really on the wrong side of you in a lot of these areas. I really <laughs> am. Because you're not going to get past my Braves. Well, I, had a, I used to work with a guy from Atlanta and I used to give him a hard time about the Braves being kind of the dynasty of one, right? You know, oh, God. Just... Touche. However, I mean, come touche. on, Smoltz, Maddox. His touche was, yes, our one championship was over Cleveland, though. And, oh, I wasn't uh, going to go there. So, uh, as I wasn't going to go there. It kind of on me a little bit. Yes, the Braves. Yeah. Um, yes, um, that, that was. Still well, the Cubs more. <laughs> there you go. We can, we can unite in that. We can yeah. unite in that. Well, um, Matt, you've done a great job. Another one of your uh, favorite lifestyle brands, um, Bill. Very good to meet. Good job. He's got to share your address so we can share some, send some beer. You're doggone right. 
He doesn't give right. the address now. He's out in the. He's a, a survivor now. He's out in the uh, backwoods. Which is <laughs> that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have um, lived your third piece of advice to your kids, and that's learn how to survive. Yeah, I've done that. I've done that. Uh, what's the best way for people to kind of connect with your brand, Bill? Um, what's where, where can they go to to find it and learn more about it? Fatheads.com. Um, make sure you put the S on it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a sticker of Bo Jackson on your wall. Um, so, <laughs> fatheads.com. That's right. It's not the peel off uh, stickers. Right? Exactly. You can find out what's going on with us, and obviously, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all that stuff. We're we're on, active on those channels as well. That's great. That's and great. Come visit us in you know Pittsburgh or Ohio. I'd love to. I've never been up to. Uh, well, I've been there, but I've never been up to uh, Lake Erie. I'd love to kind of check out the lake. Well, we, we, love, Matt, you said you're coming out to Lake. Pittsburgh soon, right? You're coming out to Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. So, yeah, the great, the Great Lakes. They're great for a reason. For sure. All right, gentlemen. Another successful winning at work in the books. Matt, any final closing comments? Just thank you again for joining us, Bill. It's always a pleasure to uh, you know hear your thoughts. Yeah, great connecting with you guys. Thanks for thinking of me.